You're listening to the Scotiabank Market Points podcast. I'm your host, Greg White. Market Points is part of the Knowledge Capital series, a collection of audio, video, and written commentary from Scotiabank Global Banking and Markets leaders designed to provide you with timely insights and analysis. Like most places in the world, Latin America is on the road to recovery, but not yet out of danger from the COVID-19 pandemic. Various countries across the region still face political challenges while trying to manage that recovery. But how has the market responded? Vice President and Deputy Chief Economist at Scotiabank, Brett House, is back on Market Points to provide his outlook on Latin America. Hi, Brett. Welcome back to the podcast. Always great to have you. Good to be with you, Greg. Let's jump right in. Uh, how is the road to the recovery looking in Latin America? Well, like most of the world, Latin America had an unprecedented shutdown in the second quarter of 2020 at the onset of the pandemic. And also like most of the world, the rebound and recovery has been a bit faster than most initial projections anticipated. Uh, we've seen a really good degree of progress in most Latin American economies on getting major parts of the economy back into action again as the pandemic and public health restrictions have allowed. And if you look across Latin America, most of the region's major economies hit about 95% reopening in terms of economic activity uh, around uh, the beginning of this year or toward the start of the spring. What is Lagging the overall economic recovery is a recovery in employment. And in this, Latin America is no different from the rest of the world. The sectors of LATAM's economies that have been slowest to reopen are those where physical distancing is the most difficult. And so we're talking about service sectors and specific areas like hospitality, culture, entertainment, tourism, travel. These are all areas that have reopen far more slowly than the economy as a whole. The problem is, and the challenge is for most economies, these are also very labor intensive sectors where we employ a lot of people for every unit of output or every dollar or peso of value that gets added. And that means employment recoveries have generally lagged the economic recovery. In general, we think GDP as a whole is at or approaching pre-pandemic levels, depending on how you slice it and dice it in most economies. If you look at a monthly or quarterly basis, uh, we're pretty much back to pre-pandemic levels in most cases. If you're looking at a four-quarter sum, you know, a whole year of activity, that's going to take a quarter or two more until we hit a pre-pandemic number. Uh, but overall, Economic reopening is well on track, even though it does face some hiccups here and there as we see some pandemic resurgences and some lockdowns in order to respond to it here and there. What about the situation in the Pacific Alliance countries more specifically? Can you go into a little detail on what you're seeing there? Yeah, well, we look very actively and intensively at what's happening in Mexico, Chile, Colombia, and Peru. And what's notable there is that you saw in Chile and Peru particularly some of the biggest support packages, both in terms of fiscal spending uh, from government budgets and uh, intensive monetary support in order to lift and maintain businesses and households through the shutdowns last year and into the beginning of the vaccine rolls, rollouts this year. And despite you know some of the biggest downturns in places like Peru in 2020, We are anticipating as a result of that support some of the strongest rebounds uh, this year that you'll see anywhere across emerging markets, uh, particularly in Peru and to some extent Chile as well. Colombia and Mexico follow behind with slightly softer rebounds, but those are on the back of what were uh, shallower downturns in 2020. In Mexico's case, some of the lockdowns and public health control measures were a bit lighter. The degree to which business closed in 2020 was a bit smaller. And in Columbia's case, you had a combination of strong fiscal supports and strong public health responses uh, that enabled the economy and households and businesses to come through the pandemic uh, with a little less scarring than we saw elsewhere in emerging markets. So overall, the Pacific Alliance is really set up for a strong year in 2021 
and a continued recovery as we go into 2022. Are you starting to see any inflation? Well, you know, just like the recovery path that I sketched out, Latin America isn't an exception to what we're seeing in the rest of the world in terms of a rebound in prices. If you look at month on month measures, so how prices are evolving from one month to the next, uh, you are seeing a quickening uh, in inflationary price increases. And of course, if you look at year on year measures, which is how inflation targets are defined for central banks, not just in Latin America, but in the rest of the world. And all four of the Pacific Alliance countries are inflation targeting countries. Brazil, also the big economy in Latin America, is an inflation targeting country. Those targets are defined in terms of year on year inflation. So comparing where price levels are now to a year ago. And considering that those comparisons month by month are with the early days of the pandemic when activity was shut down and demand was weak, uh, those price increases look pretty strong in year on year terms. But as we continue to move forward and those comparisons are made against months where reopening was occurring, uh, those year on year measures of inflation are going to look a little more muted. So. Overall, we think Latin America's recent increase in year-on-year inflation is going to be broadly transitory, just as Jerome Powell and the Fed anticipate in the U.S., but there are concerns that there will be some bleed from some of these transitory effects into longer-run underlying inflation. And so that's why you've seen surprise moves from Benjico in Mexico moving interest rates up by a quarter point about two quarters earlier than most of us expected they would do. And in the case of Chile, also a preemptive move a few months in advance. Uh, They're likely to be followed by the central bank in Colombia and with a longer lag uh, by a rate increase in Peru probably next year. But those moves are not the beginning of a major uh, or front-loaded hiking cycle in, you know, in an effort to take rates substantially higher, but are more a reflection of a gradual shift by central banks to return interest rates to normal levels that are close to making real interest rates. That is the nominal rate with inflation subtracted from it back closer to what we see as a neutral policy setting, where central banks aren't providing exceptional support, nor are they trying to ratchet back on activity, but are being a little more, as I said, neutral in their influence on the economy. The real exception is Brazil, where we have seen much higher inflation and a much uh, more front-loaded approach to raising interest rates to try to ensure that those inflationary forces are brought under control and the eventual terminal rate that the central bank has to get to uh, is a bit lower than would be the case if they took a more gradual approach. Mexico similarly has seen a big increase in inflation, uh, but we are expecting some of that to be transitory and some of it to be reflected in underlying prices going forward. And that's why you're seeing a slightly more front-loaded move to higher rates in Mexico than in the other three Pacific Alliance countries. But overall, I would underscore, we are not at the onset of a hyperinflationary or even strongly inflationary cycle ahead. We do think that, you know, we are going to see higher prints over the next few months than we've seen in past years, uh, but we will see a gradual convergence back to the Uh, inflation targets that central banks have set for themselves over the next year and a half. What about on the fiscal policy side of things? What are you expecting there after sort of a year plus of of stimulus? Well, you know, there are some real shifts uh, that are going to be happening in the Latin American fiscal stances over the coming year, largely because we are at an inflection point where we're not fully past the pandemic. Uh, but we are well advanced in the reopening and recovery. And the degree of stimulus and support that we're provided next year doesn't really need to be maintained. Uh, That said, the weaning process needs to be reasonably gradual, and it needs to take account of developments that are happening both domestically and internationally at the same time. On the domestic front, you have 
a lot of political developments with a heavy electoral calendar in Latin America this year with Peru's uh, congressional and presidential elections, uh, primaries, and then a presidential election in Chile, along with a constitutional reform process. Uh, the beginning of jostling for a presidential campaign next year in Colombia and the midterm elections recently happened in Mexico. And so you know, there is a need to offset uh, some of the uncertainty that comes along with those electoral processes and a need to ensure that support is maintained where needed when uh, COVID outbreaks occur and lockdowns are reimposed as we saw in May in Argentina. And as we've seen with some resurgence uh, in Colombia, Peru and Chile in the spring, northern spring of this year. Uh, so they're, they're going to be in a gradual adjustment path on fiscal policy mindful that they need to keep an eye on debt sustainability concerns and international capital markets uh, view on the sustainability of their public debt pictures. But one thing to note is that, you know, particularly in Chile and Peru, debt levels uh, remain at very low ratios to GDP compared with the rest of the emerging world and with most of the developed world for that matter. Um, Colombia has seen its debt to GDP uh, ratios come up a bit higher. And as a result, you do see a concerted effort toward a fiscal reform program underway there. Mexico you know, didn't provide nearly as much stimulus as the others as a share of its economy through the pandemic. And so some of the adjustment there is smaller and can certainly be more gradual. Have you seen continued uh, healthy trade among the Pacific Alliance countries and then, of course, with other trading partners outside of Latin America? Well, one of the important things to remember is that the Pacific Alliance is uh, a trade pact that is trying to pursue open regionalism, a uh, reduction in tariffs amongst its members. Canada has applied for associate membership along with countries like Australia and Singapore in that pact. And so these are economies that understand the importance of trade and are devoted to ensuring greater integration between them and with the rest of the world, uh, which is ultimately a hedge against any local volatility and developments. Mexico and Colombia tend to be more linked to the United States in terms of their foreign trade than the others, while Brazil, Chile, and Peru see a higher share of their trade linked to China. But in all five cases, while we saw a dip in trade last year, we've seen a substantial rebound in initial numbers. And that reflects global developments, where although we saw a bit of a pullback from some indicators of globalization during the Trump presidency and the tariff war that he was waging with China, we have actually seen total trade numbers globally sustain themselves only just off the highs from a few years ago. So broadly, I would say continued commodity demand and the extent to which it stems from the recovery in China and developed markets is a positive for trade exports from places like Chile, Peru, Colombia, and Mexico, and Brazil for that matter. Um, and we're also seeing what is a reset in terms of international relations under the Biden administration, which is adding some greater certainty to international economic relations, both on the capital flow front and the goods flow front. And that should continue to support trade going forward. The notion that globalization is in retreat, I think, was overdone coming into the pandemic and certainly has withstood the pandemic to a greater extent than many expected. And I think that's going to be a basis that sees trade continue to rebound for the region as we go into 2022. That's very encouraging. Uh, you touched on this a little bit earlier with respect to the political challenges that are being faced in the region. How is the market reacting to those challenges? Well, it's a good question. And I think it's worth underscoring that markets have maintained an awful lot of faith in Latin America's major economies, even through the pandemic and what have been some attended periods of political volatility, most notably in Peru, where we saw a succession of administrations uh, come and go over the last year and 
some elections this year that produced some uncertain results that took a long time to pin down and results that were not entirely anticipated by polls and some uh, market makers. Even in the midst of this, we've continued to see Peruvian sovereign debt trade tight to U.S. Treasuries compared with other major emerging markets. And here I'm thinking about South Africa, Brazil, uh, major economies in Asia Pacific. And Chilean debt continues to trade even tighter to U.S. Treasuries than any of those other EM peers. So, you know, more than anything I can say, I take that as a sign that investors as a whole continue to put strong faith in policymakers and economic and financial institutions in the region. And that was shown most notably back in November of 2020, when only a week after a change in finance minister, the Peruvian sovereign issued its largest ever debt placement at over 4 billion US dollars. And that included a tranche of bonds that had a 100 year maturity on them, a so-called century bond. And there are few indications of long run belief in a country and its economy than investors' willingness to hand money over to its government with a view that they're not going to be repaid for 100 years. It's worth noting that large, uh, very highly rated credits like Canada have never issued at that tenor, and that was overly subscribed. At the same time, you're seeing places like Chile, uh, where Scotia participated in the issuance of a large social bond that shows that investors and markets are not only willing to support traditional issues, but new financing tools that are meant to ensure greater prosperity and greater inclusion in the economies in Latin America that they're investing in. So overall, I think we've seen markets provide a strong indication of continued trust and support for these economies. And I think given the macro forecast that we've laid out here, and in our publications for a strong rebound through the end of 2021 and into 2022, we think those investors are going to see their faith rewarded. That was Brett House, Vice President and Deputy Chief Economist at Scotiabank. You can now find Scotiabank's Market Points on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Spotify. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And we want to hear from you. Please rate and review us. Your feedback helps us improve the capital markets content we create for you. You can also find more thought-leading content on our website, gbm.scotiabank.com. And you can also follow us on Twitter at ScotiabankGBM, as well as our LinkedIn showcase page under Scotiabank Global Banking and Markets. Please refer to our legal disclosures on our website. I'm Greg White. Thanks for listening.